Tuesday the 31st of January 2023. A couple of days ago I did mention an earthquake in the Xinjiang area, which is northwest in China, of a 6.1. And the aftermath of this, well, have a look at this report. The good news is, according to state media, there were no casualties or fatalities. I myself have been in a earthquake once in around about 2010, maybe 2011 in uh, Cebu in the Philippines. I was actually having lunch and the whole house started to shake, went into the town a little bit later, started to shake again. A year after I went to the area where the earthquake happened, I think it was over a seven, but I can't remember the number. But what is it like to be in a earthquake? This is one supposedly in Nepal from round about eight years ago. Just round the corner in China is flood season and I found this article. Since 2015, China has begun upgrading 30 of its biggest urban areas for being a sponge city. But they don't seem to work because if we look at 2020, uh, Chongqing was flooded and also Wuhan was flooded as well. And these are meant to be sponge cities. I think what needs to be done is a lot better drainage and you feel like this is just propaganda that I'm going to show you in a moment or two and China does very little effort apart from saying it's a sponge city, we let in the water, then it can go into the wetland, then it can go somewhere else etc. We will from maybe April time, maybe even earlier from March, see some floods in China and you will see the same devastation. So all this upgrading, we sort of don't really believe it. And it just needs, I would say, better drainage and more protection with some, I don't know, some sandbags, for example. Regardless, have a look at this. Lots of people are remembering near enough three years ago that we never heard of a city called Wuhan, near enough in central China. And this is where the CCP virus, the Wuhan virus, COVID-19 did originate from. Any of the other conspiracy theories just don't make sense. And they don't make sense because of logistics. When someone says it start, started in America, it doesn't make sense. The logistics with the virus doesn't work. You don't need to be a brainiac to work it out. Some people said, oh, it started in Italy. Well, the logistics, again, don't make sense, etc. 
what happened in Wuhan before the lockdown, people could leave. They couldn't fly domestically, but they could leave the actual city. They could fly internationally. And that's how COVID was spread around the world. It was the Chinese government basically spreading. People said at first it came from the Wuhan wet market. And what has happened to that wet market? Still in Wuhan, people are remembering near enough for the first time in three years because of the lift of the zero COVID restrictions can go out and they would buy some kind of flowers to plant to remember the people who passed away in Wuhan. I'm a person who doesn't really delve into politics. I'm a very simple kind of person, logical, yep, yeah, used to be a businessman, but when it comes to different kind of politics, I'm not so interested, but some people are. This is your channel, and I did find this article for about five minutes, which does explain the Chinese government in a quite logical and simple way. This is from a, another YouTube channel, but I do have permission, hopefully, to show it to you but it's quite interesting how it is and then you can compare it to a democracy like the UK or the United States of America or even Canada or possibly France and Germany etc. As you probably know the People's Republic of China is an enormous country with 1.4 billion people and just like its population the government is also massive. Controlled by the Communist Party of China there are several different components that make up the government by law, but these branches essentially have no checks and balances. The most major or populous branch is the National People's Congress. Consisting of 2,980 members, it is the largest parliamentary body in the world, making the nation's legislative branch unicameral. The entirety of the NPC does not meet in full session except for two weeks every year, where the most important legislative matters are settled. For most of the year, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, forming just 170 members, stays in session, and these members are the most important out of all of the MPC. These 170 members do not have the opportunity to hold other government positions, as they are full-time legislators, unlike most of the NPC. As I said earlier, China's government does not have the concept of checks and balances, and the NPC gives a perfect example of this. By many accounts, it acts as a rubber stamping body for the State Council, the main executive branch, and the Politburo Standing Committee of the Communist Party, which contains the highest officials of China. I'll get to both soon. Anyways, how are people exactly involved in the People's Republic? Well, not very involved. Citizens do vote for a local People's Congress, who in turn vote a member to the NPC. Also, these candidates must be part of the Communist Party, or be associated perhaps with an allied party. Moving to the executive branch now, the state council consists of 35 members, with a premier, an executive vice premier, and at this current date, three other vice premiers, five state councillors, and 25 other executive officials who are each in charge of different bureaucracies. The premier, who is chosen by the president, is the main executive leader, and serves as the head of the government. Still, the premier is not the highest ranking official in the country. Instead, that position is given to the president. However, the president, by the law of China, is a ceremonial position. Then why does the president of China, Xi Jinping, have most of the power in the country? This is due to him simultaneously holding the office of General Secretary of the Communist Party. The General Secretary is by Chinese law the paramount leader of China, being the head of the Communist Party and therefore having supreme political authority. In recent transfers of power, the first Secretary of the Secretariat, another high-ranking official in the Communist Party, succeeds the General Secretary after his resignation. This transfer of power is informal but has become the norm in recent years. 
Additionally, Xi Jinping holds the office of military chairman, putting him in charge of all military sectors of the government. Now hold on, did you just say that the military forms a branch of the government? I sure did, and this branch is called the Central Military Commission. By law, they hold command over the People's Liberation Army, the main military forces for China, the People's Armed Police, a special paramilitary force involved in homeland defense and riot control, and the militia. In practice, however, the armed forces of China increasingly answer mainly to the Communist Party, rather than the Central Military Commission. I should note that the People's Armed Police are separate from the People's Police, the main police force commanded by the Ministry of Public Security, a bureaucracy managed by an officer in the State Council. The final pieces of the government I'll discuss have to do with the judicial system. There is the Supreme People's Court, headed by the Chief Justice, which manages most judicial matters in the country, and serves as a last resort court. Additionally, a prosecuting branch of the judicial system exists, the Supreme People's Procuratorate. However, the laws upheld by the judiciary is not enforced in full in the special territories of Hong Kong and Macau, at least for now, as they have their own courts. But no discussion on the Chinese government is complete without an explanation on these special administrative regions, special economic zones, and the autonomous regions of China. I'll go into depth in all three of these in future videos, but the special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau have the greatest autonomy from the central government of China. They can, by law, manage their own economics, courts, legislators, and languages, among other things. Despite this, the National People's Congress can still unilaterally write laws into place in these regions. Special economic zones exist in several parts of mainland China, most notably in an area of Shanghai, several areas in Guangdong province, and the entire province of Hainan. Finally, autonomous regions, including Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, Ningxia, and Guangxi, were made to give sizable minorities in certain regions of the country more autonomy. However, like Russia, the amount of autonomy these places have is a lot less in practice. The only region to have an absolute majority of the native ethnic group is Tibet, with over 90% of the region being Tibetan. However, Uyghurs make 46% in Xinjiang, and are the largest ethnicity there. The other three, Inner Mongolia, Ningxia, and Guangxi, have sizable minorities of Mongol, Hui, or Muslim Chinese, and Zhuang, respectively, living in their borders. While Han Chinese. That is all I have time for for today. I'm not going to mention the like, subscribe, and share, and I'm not going to mention if you want to support the channel financially, and I'm not going to mention all the links are in the description below. Have a wonderful Tuesday. Be good, be well, be safe to everyone. Bye-bye for now.